be obliged to do so. It's got to be accurate. And I don't think that is. So I, I feel comfortable with the word must in the fact that if a person does destroy a property that is identified um, as a pre-1900, um, the Heritage New Zealand has the uh, ability to take enforcement action on, on that person. I, I understand that, but that's not the same as saying that if you're down the road from a heritage site, you must contact Heritage New Zealand. You must ensure that you have any authority before you destroy anything, but that's not what that provision says. It says Heritage New Zealand must be contacted regarding development in proximity to scheduled sites. And I don't think that's correct. So that wording is taken from Heritage New Zealand directly from their submission. I, yeah, I'm um, aware of that. Rephrased it slightly, and <laughs> they have, um, in terms of the rebuttal, uh, the evidence in my rebuttal, they, there's just been um, you know, acknowledgement of that. Those sites are unrecorded or recorded, so that's the proximity word that why I've used that. I understand that there could be um, you know, the, the difficulty of what is in proximity, but I feel that this is, it is guidance for the district's um, landowners and developers uh, being in the district plan in chapter 12. The word must could be a bit hard for a guidance note, uh, but it is, it is trying to stress that they do need to have a conversation with Heritage New Zealand on these matters. I'll, I'll, I'll think I'll leave it there. Is, is the purpose of that advice note to also note, because it seems to me to be unclear, it's, isn't it saying two things? Isn't it also saying that the district plan may well not be complete and, and in fact can never be complete and there's a second database that relates to the Heritage New Zealand archaeological sites records? Is that part of what that is, is trying to say? Well, it's, uh, no, it's not trying to say that. Should it? Um, well, I mean, the district plan does not capture all archaeological sites. No, I know that, but it said, the first sentence says the district plan identifies heritage items and then full stop. Shouldn't it clarify the situation to actually say that there's a link between those two provisions? because someone can't rely on the district plan well, to be clear that they're not um, interfering with archeological um, matters of interest? Well, I think, think you've got the first sentence, the district plan identifies heritage items, comma, notable trees and Maori sites and areas of significance on the planning maps, full stop. Yes. Archeological sites, both recorded, identified, by the NZAA Archaeological Association and unrecorded are protected under the Heritage New Zealand Poyotanga Act. So for me, that sentence clearly identifies that they there may be sites that are not scheduled. But, but in the interest of making sure that people know what it says, shouldn't we make it clear? Because it's not clear to me, I'd have to say. I mean, you're right if you're an expert and you actually know what these two acts do, but if, if this is an introduction to someone that's not sure if they can dig a ditch on their farmland or, or something, I'm not convinced that they're going to actually know the subtlety of what it is that says. And I, and I don't think we want to have to rely on someone ringing up Heritage New Zealand to get clarity on what that means or, or, or contact the district council. So no, I don't okay. want to get into a debate, but you, you would accept the point that I'm making, that the intention of that is, is partially to, to record that there are these two separate provisions and the district plan, just because something's not scheduled in the district plan, doesn't mean to say that it may not have, the may not, a property may not have archeological significance and so that, forth. That's correct. I, yes, okay, so that's, that's fine, I thank you. Take that's cool. Yes. Thank you. Can I just take you to, um, and this is probably more for the um, for Mr. Searle or Mr. Um, Mr. Gard. It's this definition relating to drip lines of tree. Yes. It just seems odd to me that the definition of a drip line um, 
relates to something that isn't, that's got another definition. Um, it means the ground beneath the foliage of a tree area surrounding a tree, known as the tree protection zone. But that's not really the drip line. I mean, in, in common parlance, the drip line is the drip line, isn't it? It's where the canopy extends to. And I just wonder if, again, there might be too much technical jargon in this definition to make it readily understood by people. So the, the submission uh, talked about the, the uh, existing definition not being clear when you were talking yes. about a deciduous tree. Yes. So uh, in researching, um, you know, the, the talking, I should say, with um, the arborists, and I will get um, Gordon and, uh, sorry, Kevin and Grant to um, do the technical conversation with you. But the, the shape of the tree, as stated by um, Grant earlier this morning, does actually come into play. And so yes, okay. in terms of the technical stuff, we are trying to align that with good agricultural practice. Okay, no, that's fine. I, I don't think I need to um, get that clarification. We'll see it when the, when the revised drawing comes in. That will be helpful. Can I just ask though, is it intended that the, this two, it says in the definition, and I've gone back a page, the extent, um, it's all the formula or the extent of the canopy spread. Is it intended to be the greater of those two or can you pick and choose which one applies? I'll just, I'll just turn you to Grant, sorry. Uh, just to clarify, Mr. Chair, the formula is applicable to fastidic tree species only. So the canopy spread is relevant to broad spreading growing species, tree species. Right. Okay. okay. So is that clarified? Okay. So that okay, that's not that wasn't altogether clear, but it is now that you've explained it. So that's fine. Thank you. Yes, that's why we're sort of putting two diagrams in there. So we've got one for the broad spreading and one for the fastidic trees. Okay, I, I didn't quite follow that either. I thought there was a replacement, but that's okay, that's helpful. Okay. Getting on to perhaps now more substantive matters, because I don't want to spend um, too much time just on, on, on words. If we go to paragraph 143, which is the, the recommended amendments to policy 7.1.2, which is about the identification of heritage items. I suppose the, the first question is um, where it says where the values may include and there's a list. That implies that that's a non-inclusive list and there may be something else um, that applies. And when you look at the schedule, it uses those same general terms. So I guess the question is, is, is having a, a non-inclusive list there appropriate? I think it's, uh, I think it's actually the use of the word may. Um, it, it should be an inclusive list in terms of the criteria. So I okay. guess taking the word may out. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. The second point is, and I just wonder, if, you, if we go forward now to, to the next, um, policy in this, which is the policy 7.1.3. I'm sorry to move around all over the place, but um, there's it is set out there and it has that same may include under 7.1.3b. It seems to me that 7.1.2, the one that we were just talking about, which simply says we need to schedule trees having regard to these factors. Whether in the interests of clarity, policy 7.1.2 is actually redundant, provided that 7.1.3b uh, refers to scheduling of, to, to incorporating the two together, if that makes sense. Uh, Mr Chair, I did, did consider that and consider the potential for repetition. However, mm. I, I did feel that um, both 7.1.2. I'll just go back to that, shall I? Yes, there sorry. 
7.1.2 there it is, there. Um, is identification and those matters, those values are key to the to I, the identification and <laughs> scheduling. But yes. then they are also matters that need to be considered when looking at um, heritage items and the protection of those items. So it's a reiteration of ensuring that when when a resource consent comes in, they there is no there is no um, misunderstanding that those values fall away at the point of identification, and then you don't have to worry about them when you're protecting the scheduled heritage items. So hence, I've left them in there. All right, that's okay. That's fine. I understand. I understand the logic. I'm. I'm just... Can I take you to? Um... Uh, going back to policy 7.1.2 and getting, whoops, paragraph 179. Sorry if everyone's going dizzy from the screen manoeuvring. I just want to ask you a couple of questions um, about what this um, means. So if we look at um, clause C of policy 7.1.2, Sorry, 7.1.3 it is, I'm sorry, not 7.1.2. I've written it down wrong. Um, firstly, should, should in C when it says, relationship between heritage building site structures, places and their settings, I understand that part, including the view of the heritage item are retained. That seems pretty broad, you know, in the sense that you know, where are those views from? Are they from public spaces? Are they all views? Because it seems to me that that's got the potential to actually say, um, to have quite far reaching effects that may go beyond what what the intention of the of that policy is. Oh, I, I totally agree. But there's, I didn't, uh, wasn't able to correlate a submission to uh, remove that last, sen that last part of that sentence. My opinion, it should stop at setting. But okay, we're, we're no taking difference. a fairly um, broad view of submissions, and if we can find one that's broadly on the theme, and something needs to be fixed, we're inclined to fix it. If I, if you could take, if you take my point, um, so we're happy to get the that recommendation, and we can have a look yep. and see whether there's a submission that we can shoehorn that point into. Um, Dr. McEwen, was there something that you wanted to um, say about that? Um, I, my feeling is that it bears upon the 10 metres from the road uh, provision, which I think was Waikato District Council. Yes, yes, and, and we have proposed, uh, uh, the recommendation is to remove that in terms of the rules relating to site development. So that might be the hook. It might be a consequence, it might be a consequential to that, okay. I just want to get your technical view or well, your technical views from the two of you on on some of these. That's why um, I'm I'm asking. Um, in E, I'm just intrigued as to how you can protect. I can see how you can protect something from being demolished or removed. Well, I'm, I'm not even sure about the latter. But what do you what does it mean by protecting scheduled items from relocation? Do you mean, because I, I can see you can prevent it, or but protect it from relocation seems to me to not be a logical choice of words. Um, I mean, that's, yes, I, I can see your point there as well. Uh, I mean, in terms of E, it is to, it is to identify that demolition, relocation and removal shouldn't uh, easily occur to a scheduled heritage item. Um, relocation is probably the seen as the um, yeah, option of last resort. La exactly, thank you very much. Um, but there, it sh you should protect your scheduled items from any of those three actions. So maybe. But aren't they in a, aren't they in a hierarchy though? And th for the reasons that you've said. Yes, but yes, and maybe that is that we, we would, uh, you know, have the ability to, to refine that uh, policy further. Um, in terms of how they're listed there at the moment, that's how it's stated in the rules. So I've just, I've just followed the 
um, the format of the plan in that sense. Right, and I also I also wonder too is aren't the caveats on that actually important? Because it's not just changing the semantics of the of the policy, protecting scheduled items from demolition, relocation, or removal is fairly directive. You know, it basically says you can't do it or you can't readily do it, and it's something to be discouraged in all but pretty you know extreme circumstances. But aren't those caveats when they are a, a serious risk to human life, um, you know, and all those sorts of things? Isn't it important to have that 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 exemption clearly set out, mirroring the language in section six relating to inappropriateness um, caveats? Well, I, I don't I don't feel that those caveats should be anchored into the policy framework because the activity status for demolition, relocation, or removal. Um, is either be a discretionary activity or a non-complying activity. So the you know the the specifics of each site can be assessed through a resource consent process. So the reasons for relocation, re demolition, or removal, be it um, serious risk to human health or it's no longer economically viable, would be those matters that would be considered at that time. I feel if, it, if you anchor yeah. it a policy that becomes the um, um, immediate rationale for for achieving that policy. How do you, I mean? I understand that, and that's that's a very fair point. But how do you how do you get anybody to be able to consider those factors in a non-complying or discretionary activity? Bearing in mind that discretionary is not, you know, the be all and end all of activity status. It's sort of generally seen as potentially appropriate subject to conditions and so forth. How, how, do you, how, how would someone say, in terms of the policy framework, to say actually this building's really unsafe and there's nothing practically I can really do about fixing it? The policy says you've still got to protect it. So you'd be contrary to that before you started. That's, that would be, that is true, uh, but then you would rely on the effects. So you would have a suite, you know, um, and a, an applicant would have to um, set out the suite of effects of not dem demolishing or removing or relocating. But, that but, but it's the adverse effects that have to be considered. And the adverse effects would be the effects on the heritage value, not weighing up the benefits of safety against the negative effects of of collapse or injury to health. So I, I think you've created, I, I would have thought that you're creating a policy framework that says if you've got a, a building that's inherently unsafe, you know, 10% of code or 5% of code and essentially falling down, I'm not sure how you could ever get consent for a non-complying activity because of the thresholds that would apply. And I don't know if that's necessary. I, I totally get the point that you're not wanting to make a, you know, an easy option to say, oh, well, we've tried a bit and it's all too hard, so we're going to demolish it um, using, the, using the caveat. Mm. But I just wonder whether you've created um, a problem by moving that line too far the other way. Well, I think uh, possibly for, for uh, discretionary, uh, however, I mean, a an A-ranked building is um, seen as significant for the district. So, being non-complying, um, you know, it, it's the the policy direction should should more or less uh, in, align with with um, try everything you can to keep that building there. Um, but it doesn't say that, I guess, I, and I agree with that, but it doesn't say that. It just says protect it from demolition. And if you're saying protect it from demolition, you're effectively saying that in a policy sense, that's a prohibition, unless you've got the ability to say there are exceptional circumstances relating to safety or something else. And I just, I don't quite see how you can take all the caveats away and still have a non-complying activity rule. One, because you'd never pass the threshold, because I'm pretty sure 
you'd say it's not protect it's not being protected so you're contrary to the policy the effects on heritage by knocking the building down would not be less than or would not be no more than minor but almost by definition because they're in the schedule end of story and then you're left with a with a completely unsafe building with no ability to um, to remove it and I mean we, Dr McEwen will remember the conversations that the panel had in Christchurch around some of those issues. Um, I'm certainly not advocating that we provide a get out of jail card for people with um, rank A heritage buildings, but where something is inherently unsafe and can't be fixed, surely the policy framework has to acknowledge the possibility there. Well, I think that um, there, is, there is case law that does um, take take all those matters on board and I mean in terms of looking at the sustainable um, use of that resource the economics um, and safety come into it uh, so um, I take your point in the language of the word protect we you know may it should may um, we Maybe have a think about it. I don't, I don't yeah, want you to, you. To, you know, to try and draft things on the on the hoop. The hoop, yeah, I appreciate. Um, that. And I, but I, but I am very keen to make sure that we don't have to rely on, a, you know, if, if some, one of these circumstances arose, someone would have to rely on a case from somewhere else that said, well, if the district plan wasn't written clearly enough, it's clearly not the intention for that to happen. Well, if that's the case, we should sort of address it proactively and and um, and fix it up. It seems to me. I'm just mindful of the fact, I know we haven't, we're running a little bit behind schedule and I haven't finished yet. I've got a few more I want to ask you about. Um, because we've got other people joining the other meeting at quarter two, and so that they're not left stranded and wondering what's going on, I think what we might do is uh, take our 15 minute break now and then come back um, at quarter two on the new code and we'll just carry on where we are. We'll do a brief introduction to the people that are joining that session and then we'll carry on um, and conclude my questions which won't take very long but which we can do at the, at the front end of um, the next session because I think we'll move through things reasonably quickly from then on. Is everyone happy with that? Yes, yes thank you. Happy on this side. Sorry um, Mr Wood you might have to um, wait around a little longer than you might have um, otherwise anticipated. Hopefully that doesn't cause you any any um, any hardship. Uh, that's fine, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. So we, if you could log out of this call, the panel could just wait for a moment, um, but if everyone else can log off, um, we'll resume at quarter to 11, thanks. Anybody still there that shouldn't be? <laughs> well, I can tell you it's still being recorded. Fletcher, 